May 1943, Central Germany, Dessau Airfield. Inside a hangar designed to contain engine explosions, Hans-Werner Lercher walked toward a modified Messerschmitt Mi 110 fighter. The aircraft sat on wooden blocks, its fuselage stripped. The war was already lost, though no German official would admit it. American bombers were destroying German industry at 800 aircraft per month. The Luftwaffe was losing pilots faster than training schools could replace them. And into this crisis, the Luftwaffe command had placed their last hope. Two Junkers Jumo 004 turbojets, the world's first production jet engines. Gleaming under harsh work lights sat the future of German air superiority, or the symbol of German industrial collapse. Lercher was 31 years old. He had tested captured American fighters. He had flown 60 different aircraft types. He understood engines the way architects understand structures. The Luftwaffe command had given him one mission, fly the 004-powered aircraft and discover what was wrong. They had one day, because by now, in May 1943, they all knew the same uncomfortable truth. The technology was revolutionary. The reliability was catastrophic. Already 200 Mi-262S were in production, waiting for engines that factories could not deliver fast enough. Lurcher climbed into the cockpit. He knew that above 8,000 feet, in cold air, where engine temperatures climbed toward 900 degrees Celsius, something fundamental was breaking. He had been briefed on the problem. The prototype Jumo 004A engines had demonstrated 100-hour running times during bench testing. But they required materials Germany could no longer obtain. Nickel, cobalt, molybdenum, all now rationed to artillery and tank armor. So the production version, the 004B, had been redesigned. Same power, cheaper materials. One critical trade-off. Time between overhauls dropped from 50 hours to 25 hours. He had 45 minutes of fuel, 45 minutes to understand why the most advanced engine in German aviation could only run for 25 hours before structural failure. He had 45 minutes to discover if Germany had created the future of air warfare, or if they had created a beautiful machine that would kill its pilots faster than they could train replacements. The Mi-110 screamed down the runway, dual engines at full throttle. Lurcher felt the vibration immediately. Not the normal vibration of a piston engine. Something different. Something cascading through the airframe like an invisible wave. The Yumo 004 had a problem that no one in the Luftwaffe wanted to admit. It was disintegrating while running. The 004 was designed by Dr. Anselm Franz at Junkers. A genius engineer who had created something technically revolutionary. An eight-stage axial flow compressor. A single-stage turbine fuel injectors that could atomize kerosene into a combustion chamber, running at temperatures that would have melted conventional aircraft engines. But the cost of this revolution was measured in hours. Not hundreds of hours. 25 hours. That was the official time between overhauls. The time at which turbine blades began to fail. Lurcher banked left, climbing toward 15,000 feet. The vibration intensified. He could feel it in the control stick. A flutter. A hesitation. The compressor blades were responding to resonance frequencies in ways the engineers hadn't anticipated. The German engineers had made a fatal calculation. When they redesigned the 004B for mass production, they had to eliminate the scarce materials. The original prototype had used nickel, cobalt, and molybdenum, strategic materials that Germany no longer had. So they switched to mild steel, to chromador alloy developed by Krupp, to folded and welded turbine blades cooled by compressed air bled from the compressor itself. The math was elegant. The metallurgy was clever. The reliability was approaching zero. At 18,000 feet, Lursch leveled off. The vibration was now a constant tremor running through the aircraft. He watched the engine temperature gauge. Needle climbing. 850 degrees Celsius. 870. The turbine blades were being cooled by compressed air that was itself being heated to extreme temperatures. It was a system balanced on the edge of catastrophic failure, and Lursch could feel that edge in every movement of the control stick. The Jumo 004 design was revolutionary because of its simplicity. An eight-stage axial flow compressor that could take air at 400 miles per hour and compress it to four times atmospheric pressure in a space the size of a man's torso. The compressed air entered a combustion chamber where atomized fuel was ignited at temperatures reaching 900 degrees Celsius. The exhaust drove a single-stage turbine that was connected by a common shaft back to the compressor, creating a self-sustaining cycle. The efficiency was remarkable. 
The power output was unprecedented. The structural stress was approaching the material limits of every component. He engaged his timer. He needed to understand the problem during flight, while the engine was under stress, while the resonance patterns were active. The American approach was different. They had designed their Allison engines with a time between overhauls of 500 hours. Not all at once. They could maintain an engine for months of continuous operations. The German calculation had been inverted. Maximum power. Minimum materials cost. Maximum speed toward operational collapse. The vibration began to change character. Where it had been a flutter, it became a series of discrete pulses. The turbine blades were entering a feedback loop with the combustion chamber. Each ignition cycle was pushing the blades toward resonance. Each resonance cycle was destabilizing the next ignition. The engineers at Junkets had switched from the original exotic alloys to Chromadur, an alloy developed by Krupp using only 12% chromium, 18% manganese, and 70% iron. These were common metals that Germany could still produce in quantity. But Chromadur was softer than the original nickel-cobalt alloys. It was more susceptible to fatigue. It could not handle cyclic stress the way advanced metallurgy could. Lurch could visualize the physics without seeing the metal. The thin chromodur blades, welded at the roots, cooled by air that was moving through their roots at speeds approaching 600 miles per hour, beginning to fatigue. Each combustion pulse created a stress wave. Each stress wave created a microfracture. Each microfracture reduced the blade's resistance to the next pulse. It was a cascading failure mechanism. It was not a question of if the blades would fail, it was a question of when. Below him, the German landscape stretched out in spring sunshine. He could see the industrial heartland, the factories that produced these engines. He wondered how many of them were currently running tests like this. How many test pilots were at this exact moment discovering the same fundamental truth. The technology was incredible. The ability to sustain it was measured in hours before blade fracture became inevitable. Lersch maintained altitude. 18,500 feet. The engines were at sustained power now. The vibration had become almost musical, a high-pitched whine that penetrated the entire airframe. He understood what was happening. The turbine blades were oscillating in a resonance pattern that their welded roots could not absorb. Each cycle was causing microfractures in the weld lines. The chromadur metal, strong under steady-state heat, was becoming brittle under cyclic stress. The Americans had understood something about mass production that the Germans were learning too late. You could design revolutionary technology, but if you wanted it to survive beyond the laboratory, you had to give it margins. Safety margins, material margins, time margins. The original Jumo 004A had been tested for 100 hours on the bench. It had demonstrated reliability across its complete operating envelope, but it required materials that Germany was rationing to the armaments industry. Nickel from Romania, cobalt from Central Africa, molybdenum from Scandinavia, all were now allocated to weapons production. In 1943, the Luftwaffe command had faced a choice. They could continue with the 004A, producing perhaps 50 engines per month, using scarce materials that could be spent on artillery. Or they could approve the 004B redesign, which would allow mass production of 200 to 300 engines per month, using common metals. The cost would be measured in durability. The 004A had a time between overhauls of 50 hours. The 004B would have 25 hours. This was not a design flaw. This was an economic calculation. Dr. Anselm Franz and his engineering team had made a heroic effort. They had designed a combustion chamber that used six flame tubes instead of eight, reducing the pressure oscillations that were causing blade resonance. They had introduced a variable geometry exhaust nozzle that could adjust the jet exit area based on engine speed. They had implemented a fuel injector system that was supposed to stabilize the combustion process. All of these innovations had reduced the resonance problem, but they had not eliminated it. In the design specifications, the 004B was rated for 25 to 35 flight hours before structural overhaul became necessary. Lurch began his descent. He had been aloft for 32 minutes. The fuel consumption of the Jumo 004 was astronomical compared to piston engines. The engine was burning 3,680 pounds of fuel per hour at cruise speed. A piston-powered Mi-110 would burn 240 pounds. The jet engines consumed fuel 15 times faster. The trade-off had been speed, incredible speed. 
the Mi-262 could fly at 540 miles per hour, while a piston-powered fighter struggled to reach 380, but at the cost of fuel capacity. The Mi-262 carried 2,470 liters of fuel. A piston-powered fighter carried 300 liters, six times less. This meant range was severely limited. Every combat mission would consume fuel at a rate that would require refueling after just two hours of operation. His port engine temperature was now 885 degrees. The limit was 900 degrees. Beyond that, the chromador alloy began to lose its hardness. Beyond that, the welded roots could no longer support the centrifugal forces on the spinning rotor. He was approaching the edge of the safe operating envelope, and he still had minutes of flight remaining. The mathematics of the situation was becoming clear. The Jumo 004 was not an engine designed for sustainable operations. It was an engine designed for desperate situations. Maximum performance, minimum durability, perfect for a nation fighting for survival, catastrophic for a nation trying to establish air superiority. The descent to the airfield was the critical phase. Lercher had to maintain engine power. He had to manage the cooling. He had to land an aircraft with engines that were fundamentally unstable. One mistake in the landing approach, one hesitation in throttle management, and both engines could flame out, or worse, a turbine blade could separate and penetrate the fuselage. He lined up with the runway. The vibration was now almost unbearable. The engines had been running for 38 minutes. In the design specifications, they still had another 12 hours before overhaul would theoretically become necessary. But Lurch could feel that the clock was running differently. The vibration was telling him that the engines were living on borrowed time. The engineers had been optimistic about the 25-hour calculation. They had been assuming perfect conditions. Perfect fuel flow, perfect cooling, perfect handling. Lurcher was not flying under perfect conditions. He was flying at high altitude. He was pushing the engines toward their thermal limits. He was discovering that the real-world service life of the Jumo 004 was going to be considerably shorter than the theoretical calculation. In combat conditions, with pilots who had to maintain power settings to escape enemy fighters, the engines would be living hours, not days, before catastrophic failure. The landing gear came down. The aircraft settled onto the runway. Lurch deployed the dive brakes to increase drag. The wheels touched concrete. The engines were still running. The vibration was still present. He rolled to a stop in front of the hangar. The engineers were waiting for him. Lurch climbed out of the cockpit and walked directly to the debrief room. He had been in the air for 42 minutes. Both engines were still running. Neither had experienced catastrophic failure. But both had demonstrated the fundamental problem that would define the Jumo 004's operational life. The data was clear. The vibration profile indicated that the turbine blades were resonating at frequencies between 2,500 and 3,200 cycles per minute. The compressor rotor was oscillating in response to combustion chamber pressure pulses. The metal was not fracturing yet, but it was fatiguing. The fatigue curve for the chromador alloy showed that at current stress levels, the welded blade roots would reach critical fracture threshold at approximately 25 to 35 flight hours. The calculation was simple, brutal, but unavoidable. A single Jumo 004 engine running at design power settings in operational conditions could sustain continuous operation for 25 hours before structural failure became inevitable. A German fighter pilot in sustained combat operations could expect an average engine life of approximately 10 to 15 hours because combat required sustained high-power operations. Combat required maneuvers that pushed the engines toward their thermal limits. Combat meant continuous throttle adjustment that destabilized the fuel flow and increased the resonance effects. By contrast, the American Allison engines powering the P-47 Thunderbolt and other fighters were designed for service lives exceeding 500 hours. Some were rated to 1,000 hours before overhaul. The mathematical difference was not just a matter of engineering preference. It was a fundamental difference in industrial philosophy. The Americans could afford to design engines with massive safety margins because they had the raw materials. The Germans could not. They were rationing every ounce of strategic metals. So they designed for minimum weight, minimum materials cost, maximum thrust, maximum failure probability. The contrast was absolute. 25 hours versus 500 hours, a 20 to one difference. An American pilot could fly 40 sorties before overhaul became necessary. A German pilot could fly 5 sorties. The mathematics of industrial production was now the mathematics of air superiority. When Lurch delivered his report, the reaction was silence. 
the Luftwaffe commanders understood the implication. The UMO 004 engine represented the future of German aviation, but that future lasted only 25 hours before the turbine blades began to fail. They could continue development. They could pursue better materials. They could attempt to improve the resonance characteristics. But all of those improvements required either time or resources. Germany had neither. The solution was technically possible. Anselm France and his team could have continued the original approach. The 004A had demonstrated 50-hour reliability, but it required metals that were now being allocated to tank armor and artillery shells. The choice was immediate. Either divert strategic materials from ground weapons to aviation engines, or accept that jet aircraft could only sustain operations for days, not weeks. The Luftwaffe command chose neither option. They chose to proceed with the 004B and hope that combat conditions would somehow be more forgiving than test flight data suggested. Lercher understood what had happened. This was not a failure of engineering. This was a failure of industrial capacity. The Germans had invented the jet age, but they had entered it with an economy that was already collapsing. They could build revolutionary aircraft. They could not build the engines to sustain them beyond weeks of operations. The Mi-262 production rate was accelerating. By August 1944, 91 aircraft would be delivered in a single month, but the Jumo 004 production rate could not keep pace. The factories were producing 50 engines per month. The airframe factories needed 200. This shortage of engines became the strategic bottleneck. Germany had roughly 1,433 Mi-262 airframes built during the war, but fewer than 300 ever flew in combat. The rest sat incomplete, waiting for engines that never arrived, waiting for turbines that were being manufactured as fast as the German industrial system could produce them waiting for components that had to balance two impossible requirements, sufficient power to overcome Allied air superiority and sufficient durability to survive long enough for the investment to be justified. By August 1944, when the Jumo 004B finally entered operational service on the Mi-262, the data had not changed. The engine still had a time between overhauls of 25 hours, but by this time, improvements had been made. The engines could now sustain 20 to 25 hours consistently. This represented a marginal improvement over the 10-hour average of the earlier production batches. Pilots still had to accept the reality that every flight was pushing their engines toward inevitable failure. The only mitigation was to design maintenance procedures that could complete overhauls quickly, to train mechanics to replace engines and turbines in hours instead of days, to accept that the Jumo 004 was not an engine in the traditional sense. It was a consumable component, an expensive, high-performance consumable that would need replacement after every 25 hours of operation. This was the lesson that Lerch carried back from that May 1943 flight. Revolutionary technology could emerge from scientific genius, but sustaining that technology required industrial resources that Germany simply did not possess. The 25-hour limit was not a failure to be solved. It was a structural reality imposed by the material conditions of the war. Hans-Werner Lercher survived the war. He lived until 1993. In his later years, he wrote extensively about his test flight experiences. He never publicly criticized the German engineers or the Luftwaffe command. But the fact remained. The Jumo 004 represented the highest point of German aviation technology, and it was fundamentally limited by industrial constraints that no engineering genius could overcome. The contrast is clear. An American Allison engine, running 500 hours. A German Jumo 004, running 25 hours. The difference was not German incompetence. The difference was American industrial capacity. By 1943, Germany was running out of the raw materials needed to sustain advanced manufacturing. America was at peak production. The air war that followed was not a contest of pilot skill or aircraft design. It was a contest of industrial mathematics. And on that mathematics, there was only one possible outcome. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this story of forgotten engineering decisions in World War II, please like and subscribe. We produce historical documentaries that tell the stories of ordinary people discovering the technological systems that overwhelmed their nations. Your engagement helps us continue bringing these forgotten stories to your audience. Where are you watching from? What other World War II stories would you like us to tell? The stories your history teachers never mentioned. Your comments help us shape future episodes. Thank you for watching Tales of Valor.